You know, there was a moment during the Olympics, I was sitting with Lennox Lewis, and David Hay was in Jamaica, and he sent Lennox a tweet. He said, Lennox, man, I'm in trouble. These people won't, ex- won't, expect, won't, won't accept my credit card. So Lennox tweeted back. David tweeted in the number. Lennox called the place in Jamaica, sorted it out. But the thing is, we were actually, it was during one of the bouts. I think it was Luke Campbell's quarterfinal. Lennox wasn't that bothered about his five live commitments, but he was bothered about his boxing brother, David Hay. That, by the way, is a true story. It played out in front of my eyes. It really, really did. Anyway, what now for the GB team of 10 boxers? Five have medals. More have professional offers. And some have alternative offers. I wanted a bit of medal-winning insight earlier, so I spoke to David Price, the British heavyweight champion and bronze medal winner from Beijing, and I started by asking Big Pricey, was it difficult for him to deal with all the options when he got back from Beijing? At first, I mean, at, the, at this stage, what the lads will be experiencing now, I mean, I, I just come home and just wanted to switch off from boxing completely and just, just at least for a week or two. So, you know, I, I just tried to, to get away from... The, the sport for a couple of weeks because it, it, it's non-stop in the build-up to the Olympic Games. It, it's absolutely non-stop. And so you want to try and switch off, although it is difficult to do so because you are pondering your next move and what you're going to do. So, you know, I, I took a... I think I went on holiday to Gran Canaria or so for two weeks and then I come back and then, you know, uh, all that time, oh, you're, out, you're, out pondering, you're out wondering what you're going to do next. Did you speak to the other guys? Because obviously, eventually everybody turned pro, but not at the same time. And you know, did you sort of speak to James, see what he was doing, or speak to Tony Jeffries, or did, were you just worried about the David Price business? No, we were. We, we were speaking to each other. If you know, it was like, have, have you had any contact off anyone? Has anyone hmm. been in touch? You know what I mean? For me personally, the promoters weren't exactly banging the door down to sign me um, at first because I, at, the, at the same time, I'd, I'd kept stum a little bit on what me what my plans were because I was carrying in, an injury um, that I needed to get sorted for the start. So I weren't going to turn pro until I, if, if I was going to turn pro sure. until after my injury was, was uh, sorted because as an amateur, you get everything sorted on, on private health, health care and things like that. So I, I wanted to just... I was never going to turn pro until after the Christmas um, cool. if I was going to. But we all kept in touch and it was a matter of... You know, we were telling each other what, what offers were on the table financially and things like that, but which uh, I probably wouldn't recommend in hindsight because it can cause a little bit of animosity, I suppose. Not not that anyone got, got jealous or anything with, with our lads. It's just that money money's the devil, isn't it? You know yeah, what I mean? So it, it can cause a, a few few little problems between people. So, yeah, we, we were all speaking and in, in touch with each other. Now, all of, all of those guys, you know, you're all being chased by different people, some more than others. But this mob, um, because it's in London and because they've had a lot of success, do you think there'll be even more pressure on these guys to make, quote, big decisions about their futures, Dave? Um, yeah, I, th- I think there will be. Um, but at the same time, you've got to realise that the the market isn't the same as what it was four yeah, years ago. Good and, point, and good point. Our, our market four years ago, you know, I wish it was what it was four years before of when the, the Athens Olympics wasn't. So, you know, at, at this stage of the game, the TV situation is, is a lot different. And I don't know, maybe, maybe the lads who, who were looking to turn over might you know, they might get a bit of a shock and realise that the, the figures in the red aren't actually out there to be earned for, for some of them. I mean, but, but for the likes of a uh, super heavyweight and Anthony Joshua, you know, that that's that's big time, I think, no matter what the economic situation is. But, um, yeah, they, you know, they're going to have promoters knocking on that door, uh, getting on the phone to them and, you know, offering them ditches and promising them everything in the world. And, it, and it's going to be big decisions to make. Um, so, you know, it's something that I think they should sit down and take take a good look at and uh, decide what the next best move for them is personally. You mentioned Big Josh there. Um, obviously, as you say, no matter what the economic climate is, a super heavyweight gold medalist, and we'll come on to one of those in a moment, uh, is always going to be inundated. What did you think of Josh overall, Big Josh? Bear in mind, he is only a kid. I think it was only his 43rd fight when he won yeah. the gold. Yeah, you, you can still see it is though, Steve. Yeah, That's you, can, can you, you, you can still see it, but but to to even to be competing in Olympic Games, never mind winning the gold medal, is a massive achievement. And I mean, 
look, I'll be honest at all, he was, he was a sad fortunate in a couple of his fights, but he was, he was there at the end of the fight to be fortunate. Yeah. And, you know, he, it was a home, home game Olympics at the end of the day. He, and what, what impressed me about him, to be honest, he, he listens to his corner, yeah. like religiously. You can see it. He takes absolutely everything in. And I think, I think his coaches had a, had a massive part to play in winning them, to, you know, getting them to the to the, the top in the uh, podium. But yeah, you know, how old is he? Twenty two. Twenty two. Yeah. Phenomenal achievement. But it, it, it it's it's a massive decision for Joshua because I, for every way to turn pro at twenty two, he's gonna they're gonna have to take the time with him. I think because as I say, he's still. Despite being such a successful amateur in terms of medals, he's still relatively new to the game. And any promoter who stands Joshua is going to be have to be willing to be patient and take the time with him, and you know, not not want to quickly turn on on the investment because I think he's got a massive future, a massive future. He's a massive future, and I think, as you say, it's going to be a long road. Now, finally, Dave, uh, you're going to make history on October the 13th. I calculate it's the first time ever that two Olympic medalists, British medalists, have ever boxed each other as professionals when you take on Audley Harrison, gold medalist from 2000, against you. How's that, how's that shaping up at the Echo? I didn't know that was that was uh, how it was to be honest. Yeah, I think making yeah, history, yeah. You make because if I go through all of the medalists going back to 1908, I yeah. can't find a, a time when two Olympic medalists have ever boxed each other. Well, that, that's, a pro. that's fantastic. I mean, yeah. uh, for me, this fight's big enough anyway. But when you when you're making history as well, and you know, it, it creates even more interest. I think, mm. especially in an Olympic year. But yeah, the, this is a um, sort of that I've been looking forward to since I've known it was happening, and now. You know, it's eight weeks out and I'm, I'm pretty much deep into camp now and it's starting to become a reality. So, yeah, it's exciting times and it's selling really well, the Echo Arena. Yeah, it it's, would. Um, it's selling really, really well. It was looking, it's heading for a sellout by the looks of it. Mm. So, you know, it's going to be it's going to be a big night up here and uh, Audley Harrison's making all the right noises. I think he's going to turn up and, and put a performance on, which is good for me because... You know, I'm expecting to win, and when I do, I want to want to beat the best for the Allison possible. So it's a credible win for me. Absolutely right. Listen, Dave, it's been a pleasure and a delight speaking to you tonight. I'll speak you to you. I'll speak to you sometime in the build-up to October 13th. David Price, thanks very much. Thanks, Bunty. That was uh, Pricey talking to me a bit earlier on. Now, his next defence, as he said there, will be the history-making British heavyweight title defence against Audley Harrison at the Echo Arena in Liverpool on October the 13th. I think it's a terrific fight then. I saw I always get people accusing me of saying Audley's going to be in great fights. I said the David Hay Audley fight was going to be a great event, which it was. It sold out. It was massive. It did sky, I think, about their second best ever pay-per-view. I never said it was going to be a great fight. I said it was going to be a great event, and uh, I still think it is. I think this one could be different. It's also, um, as I said, their history-making, because as far as I can make out, maybe someone can correct me. Call me tonight, 0207 You've got another 15 minutes of live show. The last half an hour tonight's gonna, it has been pre-recorded. That's the legacy segment. Um, well, maybe someone else can correct me, but I think it's the first time ever the two British Olympic medal winners have fought each other as professionals. I think it's the first time. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't think I am. I think I'm. I think I'm spot on with that. Anyway, I like Price. He always talks sense and he always talks so well. Now the plan tonight was to have Luke Campbell on the phone. I'm going to say this. We've had Luke on here. We checked it. We've had Luke on here eight times in the last four years. I had him on the Satanta show. He's been on the Box Nation show. He agreed to do the show, but he's vanished off the face of the earth. Now that happens with a gold medalist. It trust me, it happens. It's just the show. That I'm not going to be uh, churlish. Uh, Luke will be in an event with Nicola Adams tomorrow morning at 8:30 at the Moss Side Amateur Boxing Club. That's in Moss Side, Manchester. It's the old, um, it's the it's the, it's the old um, Phil Martin uh, training centre. I used to call it Champs Camp uh, back in the day. Anyway, that's the Moss Side Boxing Centre. Morris Core Hardcore's in charge up there, and Luke's going to be there with Nicola Adams tomorrow as part of this event, which is called Join In. And it's uh, basically there'll be 5,000 events this weekend, Friday, Saturday and Sunday around the country, zillions of different sports. Uh, and we're encouraging people to go and join in. That's why it's called, called Join In. You want to find out more about it? If your little John, your, your little Juliet enjoyed that Olympics uh, the last two weeks, then why don't you go online and just Google 
join J O I N. Separate word in I N. See if there's an event near you. For you know, in your in your town, there might be an open event at the gymnastics. There might be an open event at the handball. You'd be lucky. I don't know if there's any handball out there, but there's certainly loads of boxing, athletics, cycling. You can get your little girl, your little boy on a proper bike. One of those bikes that cost thirty grand. Hey, it's not just a chopper. Why don't you find out about it? It's called Join In. That's a bit of public service broadcasting. That's what we do here on the Beefs, and I do that all the time. Now, let's go now to the voice of amateur boxing, a man that basically just about predicted the Olympics the way they were. He was getting the scores correct in bouts between Algerians and Hungarians in the last 64. That's not an expert. That's a mystic. That's not a mystic. That's a guru. That's not a guru. It's the Bodie man, Ron Bodie. Rombo, how are you? Fine, Stevie. How are you? Listen, I've got, to, I've got to tell you, I had the uh, bronze medalist on earlier on, Karina. She gave me plenty of stick. I'm feeling you might have given her one or two lines. You don't mind me saying so? Yeah, you can laugh. She said if She's I'd have been fun, down, she? she said if She's I'd have been down, fun, isn't she? she said if I'd have been down there using my bulk against her, she thinks she might have got better than a bronze medal. <laughs> uh, she was top banana. Rumbo, the Olympics are over. Let's move forward. Um, uh, what are you hearing? Any rumours about what these, any of these kids are doing? Yeah, I think, I think the first thing to say, though, London produced two gold medalists. Yeah, brilliant. Nicola Adams, Harringay Cleach Community Club, Beautiful. Anthony Joshua, Finchley, that's big news. At, at the moment, the, as you know, they're, they're such a close team always. They're, they've always been together, you know, three, four years. It's difficult for them to make decisions instantly. Pros are talking to them left, right and centre. That, that, that's the top and bottom of it. The kids are a little bit confused because obviously they have a loyalty situation. Uh, course, and you've got course. a slight difference with this lot because obviously Robert McCracken comes from and is still in a, a professional background as well. Of course, yeah. So one thinks they'll get plenty of advice. Yeah, well, and, and advice from someone that's been inside. We've been been inside the professional beast for, yeah. for 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 a while. Now it's an interesting thing, though, Ron, because in many ways this is the first Olympics where there are some viable options. There's the World Series of Boxing, Aiba's um, yeah. professional uh, sort of semi-pro thing, and then there's the APB, Aiba Professional Boxing, which is fully pro, which gives them the chance to box without a vest, to box eight and ten rounds. And also uniquely gives them the chance to make lots of money or decent money, and but still be a potential Olympian come 2016 in Rio. It's, I mean, people might be saying, Buncey, what are you talking about? But Ron, explain it slightly if you can. Yeah, sure. And for Tommy Stalker, it, it could be interesting. I think basically the, the, the uh, Wu who runs IEBA Amateur Boxing. Dr. Wu to keen. you, Dr. Wu to you. Oh, Sir Dr. Wu, yeah, right. after the last uh, couple of weeks, I should think. But the top and bottom of it is, is that he's wanted to keep amateur boxers long in the amateur ranks. And to try and do that, he, he, he's created a hybrid of professional boxing, but you can only box in his professional boxing to box in the Olympics. And I think yeah. that that's actually open to competition if somebody wish, wishes, to, wishes to query it and take it a little bit further. It's not a bad thing for the Eastern Europeans, the Asians, and the Africans who don't have good professional setups. But in, in the Western world, as it were, where there is big professional setups, then, then the boxers are probably better off being professional. Mm. But somebody like Tommy Stalker could be very good for. Yeah. And just to, just to point this out, and it was pointed out to me by Adam Booth, George Groves' manager. George Groves, in theory, because he's only had 15 contests, even though he's the British and Commonwealth champion at super middleweight, even though he turned professional three years ago, he could sign up for the APB because you need to have had 15 or fewer contests. And he could, in theory, he's not going to do this. I'm just saying he could, in theory, do it. Box for the APB for three years and go to Rio. How mad is that? Well, uh, as you say, how mad is that? But by the same token, the same organisation yeah. banned Uganda from boxing in the Olympics because they were having ex-professional boxers who no longer held professional licences coaching their team. Yeah. And, of course, Robert McCracken himself, uh, who's a former pro, works with pros, he was um, sidelined. He couldn't be in the corner. He had to be up in the stands, where, of course, you know, he did a great job, but he couldn't be in, couldn't uh, be he, in, in the corner. 
Robert did a tremendous job, but not, not to be allowed in any of the technical areas, not to be able to speak to his boxers at the actual venue. Really I mean, that's nice. pretty, pretty tough, really. Well, listen, Rombo, oh, coming up after the break, I've got um, people on from Earlsfield, people on from the Lynn, people on from Repton, and people on from Islington, including a fantastic segment with Keith Waters. Rombo, just, just quickly, and it's only, you've only got about 30 or 40 seconds, when, is the, when, when, when do they start boxing again? Basically, they start about the 15th of September. Round about the 16th of September, Repton go out and box in Lagos. How about that for a start? I know you like a trip. That's when I got Marky Newman talking about that a little bit later. Well, listen, oh, Ron, it's, it's a delight and a pleasure having you on. I'll speak to you very soon, when hopefully when my voice has come back. Cheers, cheers, Stephen. Well done with the coverage on Radio 5 Live for the boxing. Well done. Thanks very much. That's Ron Bodie there. Now... The, the, the Ron man has got his finger seriously on just about every single pulse. Now, each.